I have seven keys to share with you. These are insights. These are attunements that you need to make. But the, the more in harmony you get these themes, the more capable you'll be of talking to both. Seven attunements. When you get these seven themes roughly in harmony, it's like, do you know how a combination lock works? Like there are these gears and there's one notch in the gear. And if you line up all of the notches in the gear, you can pull the key out, but you can't see the gears from the outside. So you don't know what the combination is necessarily. And you've got to get them all or you can't see where they're stuck. This is better than a combination lock. It's like a transparent combination lock. You can gain insight into the ways in which you're stuck and you don't have to get them all in a row. I've put them in an order or they came to me in, in, in an order. Number one, it's not just in Egypt. It doesn't have an Ibis head. And you don't need to learn ancient prayers to get through. Doth, the name, is Egyptian. And it's the name he's always invited me to use. I've been invi invited to also use Hermes and Mercury. There are plenty others. None of them work as well. So I just stick with this. But just because the name comes from their tradition doesn't mean he intrinsically belongs just to them. He's been here through many cycles and his presence is of the earth at this point. When you think of engaging with him, recognize that in every era he has communicated with people in a form they understand. So when you look at the Emerald Tablets, the language is of a form that fits more with uh, the inheritance of chivalry that was going on in the 1900s, early this is not to say that that is who he is. You have to respect that it is beyond easy for him to communicate in a form that fits. Essentially, he speaks many languages, much less many dialects. It's the god of communication. So when you seek to reach out to him, if you look in the wrong place, he might meet you there with a smile, but it mostly will cloud the experience for you. When you add to that, this sense of looking backwards, like the way to connect with him is through the temples. It's not to say it won't work, but understand that many of the influences that can affect you in that way are coming from within you. If you've spent your whole life or much of your interesting years when you've been fascinated by these themes, interested in Egypt, when you go there and you're present there in a way that connects you to ancient prayers to him, with him, it'll activate you. But you can allow that same sense of reverence to be present wherever you are. Do you really think he needs you to be in a pyramid to talk to you? Do you really think he needs you to pray in a temple to be heard. No, <laughs> no. Speak in your language, speak in your style. Listen in your language and your style. He will draw you into a depth that is appropriate for you. And by recognizing his capacity to reach to you, you can put your attention into the desire. You can put your attention into aligning these themes in a way that it's work, but it's more effective work. It will actually pay off. It's worth it. Believe in the cycles. There are certain thresholds you just can't cross if you have false beliefs in your head. We live within a lie. It is a purposeful lie. I 
can't say this enough times because it's hard to tune in and make it a part of you. Don't skirt over this as if you get it because going deeper into this trust makes a world of difference. We live in cycles. Humans are one cycle. Earth keeps incarnating different cycles. And in each cycle, there are different themes. Some of them are entirely focused on sound vibration and technology. Some of them are heavily aquatic. This one happens to be quite industrial and involve pulling out fossil fuels. They're not all like this. She works with what's there and transforms it and almost invariably erases most signs of the last cycle. The difficulty in believing this is material. If you're clinging to material reality as the primary presence, you're missing it. You have to center in spirit. And to do that, you have to center as a spirit who came here. You don't have to fully get it. You don't have to fully remember or embrace it. You just have to try it on as if you're an actor. You imagine yourself approaching Earth. Do it 3D. Don't make it more confusing. It's perfectly relevant to think in terms of three dimensions. You're staring at the Earth considering incarnating. And you're considering incarnating because Gaia is opening a new class. It's a class that goes on this course. And you know to embrace it, you're going to have to incarnate many times. And you will forget for quite a while everything that came before. That's like the precondition. That's the ante. That's what you do to be here and be involved. There are so many reasons why this is true. Listen to the channeling series. Playlist. And to tune in yourself and embrace these themes, you need to believe it. Some things you must believe before you know why, before you remember, and before you get proof. I am always open questions about all of these themes. If any of this ever doesn't make much sense, just make a comment. I'll, I'll get to you in, in the best fashion I can. And sometimes those comments are fuel for the new videos. Light, light. The universe is covered in light. There are two major ranges. Think of it this way. There's this sub-level of where the fabric of reality is illuminated. It's like, think of it as a, a diffuse silver light. And then there's a golden light from stars. That's it. We live between these two ranges of essentially light. You can see, you can sense. I know this is a shocker, but when you exist as a spirit, you don't have ears and eyes and a nose and a mouth and skin in the same way. These are unique aspects of feeling here. So to believe enough to talk with any angel, much less though, you need to have some level of ability to dissolve the lie. Mars is not just an empty rock. Jupiter is not just a gas giant. There is so much going on there. The planets themselves are conscious, and there are many, many living, vibrant beings there. No, it's not the same carbon, human, biological life. That's unique to Earth in many ways, though the foundations are quite similar in plenty of other places. But there are also many other ranges that I am repeatedly encouraged to say, life. We don't get to claim life and everything else is death. Mm -mm. Consciousness is itself living and living consciousness exists everywhere in a field, a glorious ocean of light and love. You need to envision this enough to tune in. 
It's one of these gears where it's just, if you have too heavy an investment in doubt, if you sit around constantly trying to poke holes in any potential theory that illuminates the magic, the mystery beyond the mainstream BS, you've invested in skepticism in a way that it's, it's like a shackle. <laughs> It'll shackle you to the earth. It is so normal in modern, certainly academic society to think you can just sit there and question and question and question and question aggressively, disdainfully, rude, obnoxiously in a way that undermines hope. I attempted to address this last week in the wild flow where I talked about cults. There are certainly severe dangers to believing too much, to letting go of your ability to question and scrutinize and be concerned. There are definite horrible dangers and just following something or someone over the cliff like a lemming. There are also in remaining shackled to the ground, fiercely refusing to trust and life. You have to allow some degree of faith to supersede, to come before the proof that you may want. You embody it by envisioning it and by investing that in that in a way that keeps it resonant in you. And when the doubts come, it's fine. Just don't choose sides with the doubts. They might even help you illuminate questions that matter. Just keep those questions respectful. It's the vibe of fear that infuses skepticism that's damaging. Keep your vibe within yourself and Make sure you're creating a loving hope, even with your questions, particularly with your questions. You need to be alone in your mind. What this means is in order to communicate with him regularly, you have to create space and you have to be okay enough to, to allow that space within yourself. It can feel very lonely. It's a necessary precursor. It's like clearing the table in your mind. And when you do that, you essentially have to take responsibility for everything that you're aware of. Now, in many ways, I encourage you to do the opposite of this over the course of a healing journey, but understand that it starts here. Anything that you're consistently aware of becomes your responsibility because it's what's normal to you. So you need to learn to make choices and to engage whatever layer of thought, feeling, awareness, magnetic pull to your mind. Engage it and learn to get it into a place of rest in some form, into a rhythm, into a harmony. You have to bring yourself into a degree of coherence and be okay with it. You have to be okay being alone. You have to be okay not sharing every thought and feeling the second you have them. Restrain them enough. Don't be desperate to prove yourself, to get validation from someone else. Or you can't go deep enough. And similarly, you can't fight as a replacement for those things. Fighting is just addictive as approval. You can't need someone to exist in relationship to your thoughts for a while. It's not a definite phase of time. For me, it was years. Now, he assures me it's not years for everybody. That's what it was for me. And it was very disheartening. Constantly feeling like I was getting enlightened, divine revelations that would change all of reality and constantly being brought back to, mm -hmm, it is changing all of my reality. And you have to go through that again and again and again. It is so typical for people to learn lessons, learn healing lessons, and just reach to share them too soon. 
And that reach to share them is a reach to embody the power of being the teacher when you're not really ready to be. I'm not saying it's useless. It's useful because you're trying it on, you're getting the vibes going, but it's mildly dishonest. Because even if you believe it, the reality is if you're not at peace with yourself, if you don't know how to be at peace with yourself, you can't hear the still small voice, the divine. It starts small. It starts small. It starts quiet. And it's very, very simple. You get a message. Some of it is generic. Some of it is insight about how you need to learn to change your mind, your faith patterns. Some of it is unique to you. You have certain challenges that are inhibiting your ability to be at peace. When you get these initial messages, you have to honor them. If you don't, you don't get something new. And it still works this way 20 years later. If I reach a point in which Toth is giving me guidance, and I haven't integrated or honored that guidance, he's mostly like, yeah, yeah, mm hmm nice to hear from you, uh-huh. Doesn't even remind me. Occasionally, maybe, but not much. It's my job to trace the path back and go, yeah, got it. I didn't do that work yet. And it's a process. It doesn't, it doesn't finish. I can be good at it for a while and honor the flow and learn, and then I can fall down on it and get stuck on one particular challenge that I've been given that I don't necessarily want to complete, like my book. It was scary for me to complete that. And in the final half year, I wasn't getting much new. So it becomes a bit of a, a, a clear challenge. It's not just a bit. It's a, it becomes a clear challenge to say, is it worth it to you? Do you want to stay stuck? Because much more so than people recognize, it's, it's seductive to stay stuck. There's a safety in staying stuck. The problems you know are often less frightening than the problems I don't. And I, I, I do believe that's a bit of an eternal dynamic. You might get good at handling it, but it's something to always be conscious of. You must learn to be present with yourself and your own mind. You must learn to heal whatever is in the way of allowing that to be natural, fluid, beautiful, safe. And to the extent that you do, eventually you hear more of these, these insights, still small voices, and they start like a trickle. If you follow them, they get stronger. Make a commitment. It's not particularly casual. You need to make a commitment. In my experience, those commitments are extremely clear. Often, they were of exactly the form I just finished describing. I need you to commit to healing this. And to the extent you do make that commitment, stay with you, give guidance. To the extent you don't, he'll withdraw. It's like very, it's very empowering. It's up to each of us to, to make the level of commitment we can, but he will recede. And in many ways, that's not even, there's no rudeness to this. There's, it's not even tough love. It's physics. What you put in comes back to you. Now, in the same way, I think many people are inclined to think in terms of like, oh, great Toth, I am here to be and believe in you. I give you all of my essence. He doesn't really give a shit. If that's the best that you've got, as it sometimes is, it's a, it's a gentle, humorous, loving, thank you. Get up. Stand. Do the work. I argue with him. He's tender with me. Doesn't really give me many causes to argue because much more compassionate and patient than any human that I've met. 
nonetheless, when it comes to it, it's like, it's just not this ancient reverence that's being asked of you. You'll miss him. That's missing the mark. It's not where he is. So you can try to do it that way, but it's like going 20 steps backwards in order to go 21 steps forward. It's not effective. Now, if that's where you need to begin, he'll probably match you there, but he's going to very quickly give you the guidance to, to work on yourself and to be present. And if you don't follow that initial message and remain addicted to your interpretation of what it is to be devoted to him, you're not really devoted to him. Get it? So, yes, he's asking me to pass this along. I've been very careful to cross-reference. I ask him repeatedly, really? You really want me to say that? Some things don't make it through. I misinterpret plenty of messages he gives me. This one, super clear. Those commitments build so over time, it seems to weave back and forth between do this for yourself, face this challenge to heal, digest this lesson and put it into a form within yourself that you can use it. So for me, that was a lot of healing lessons about how to help take care of people, help support people in unwinding tangled and painful energies. And I'd work with a certain theme. And if, I'd, if I got scared, which I often did, He'd recede for a while. Like, hey, that's what I asked you to work on. If you're not going to work on that. It's not harsh. It's not even severe exactly. It's just consistent. And it builds trust because over time it's like, it, it's much easier to clarify what is and isn't a genuine message. It's important to recognize when you receive a divine insight, what you remember is your interpretation. So there's a lot about clarifying your interpretation to make sure that you're getting it right. And I often would hold misinterpretations and then I'd get mad when they were wrong. And he's like, that was your thought. That's not what I told you. So when you hear words, even I hear a neutral voice almost all the time. It's neutral. And when it's more in tune, I feel it. And nonetheless, those words are still largely mine. It's important to recognize that. When it transcends that, when it goes into the, the area of dreams and visions, as it has plenty, those are startlingly important moments that help me shift gear, change course, or refocus. And in the meantime, in the in-betweens, it's really important to recognize Take responsibility. It's important to take responsibility for your interpretations and to go back and ask again, is this what you meant? Is this true? Have I, have I got this right? Keep responsibility for the work you're being asked to do and it'll work better. Give up. Give up. Give up. I see so many people awakening into spiritual power who try to claim the energy of, of deities, of angels, as their own. Now, the irony is we're supposed to over a long period of time. In many cases, not just this life, in every, in every case. I just learned this yesterday. In every case, not just this lifetime. Just because you see a spiritual potential, just because you sense it, just because you can get other people to witness you as if that's you, doesn't mean it's entirely true. You are not supposed to rush ahead and pretend you're you are told just because you can presence the energy. I'm certainly not supposed to do that. I've had several people challenge me on like, aren't you just not integrated? Aren't you just projecting a part of yourself and then, you know, refusing to acknowledge what you're doing? I've had other people say, what's wrong with you that it's taken so long to get this far? This is someone who is not staying present with a consistent interpretation that's humble. 
you are not going to replace the it's not that's not what's happening he is not an abstraction real present person more conscious and aware in this reality than you or i keep that it's true it doesn't change give up don't fight to believe that you have power that you don't don't struggle to presume that you have power that you don't don't believe that humans are in charge it's not a nebulous conspiracy of illuminati it is not a corporate cabal it is not an ancient lineage of kings none of that is what's real all of those creations are present none of them are in charge they are all collections of human beings who don't give up and so they're living out the stories they're living out the internet is covered in them and there's a dozen commentators around each of them fascinated by their own bullshit give up give up it's not you it's not them it could be so tempting to believe that the power that you sense rests in the hands of some other human being and then become terrified of it that explains right there the majority of conspiracy theories in those two sentences seriously think about it people have an innate desire to believe that other human beings are the ones who are in charge and then they get terrified about it because it's insanity to think that human beings are actually in charge we're fucking incompetent to the extent that we've been given as much latitude to be as reckless and destructive and hateful and violent as we've been given the primary reason was to convince us eventually to give up get it it's a it's a precondition you can stray you can go back he'll stray he'll recede you can doubt you can drag it out give up again when you give up he'll almost immediately tell you to stand up again you don't get to just be a little duckling forever you can go back to him and ask him what his opinion is but he's almost invariably going to tell you to do something and it won't always be clear it will often involve you needing to exercise your own agency in the challenges in your life you don't get to give up authority for yourself you need to give up the belief that you are anything other than what you are you surrender to the respect for the world that everything that is yours all of your karma everything you've generated in this lifetime and in every other lifetime all of your karma is yours give up trying to distance yourself from it give up trying to believe you're anything other than you and allow that spiritual guidance and authority to be over you give up be over you he guides your crown when i first opened the ability to communicate spiritually it was very distinctly because i surrendered my crown very distinctly i was essentially a rebel against divine energy i was trying to explain everything i was obsessively intellectualizing the feelings and themes i was going through i was not giving up to the spiritual guidance i was receiving and at a certain point i was working with the seven chakras and i recognized that my lower six chakras were all aligned deeply in harmony against my crown i was fighting all of these six chakras were fighting my own crown it's like a rebel against divine light and i finally surrendered and i felt completely insane and as soon as i did my mind went bonkers and light poured down and it felt awesome and i just sat there and i let the light rewrite me it was beautiful and i've never never been as frightened since then of anything since then 
That's not perfect. I've got, I've had lots of work to do, lots of challenges, but it's a very distinct transition. When I gave up, I was a bit of a drama prince. So I don't encourage you <laughs> to push it that far. You can give up in much calmer, more you know, patient steps than I did. Nonetheless, do it. Basically just means be humble in the face of the divine. Finally, appreciate what you're given. This one's tough. In most ways, it's the most difficult. When you give up, you're giving up a certain sense of power and control. You're giving up the belief that you control your life to the extent that many people believe they do, or at least try to believe that we do. When you embrace what is real, what is actual and what is present as exactly what spirit's giving you, something changes. When you give up, it's the difference between saying, what do I want to do? And saying, what am, what am I asked to be? Now, actually you find quite quickly that what you're being asked to be is a function of you. So the world witnesses you, the divine presence in this love, the Holy Spirit, the guy in blood that weaves us together, knows you, knows your faults, knows your flaws, knows your weaknesses, knows your dreams, knows your desires, and is presenting you a course that weaves them together far more beautifully than anything any of us can do on our own. And so when you give up, you embrace what is. And I remember very distinctly being introduced to what happened when my life fell apart. I had a lucrative career, a path that I thought was perfect. Wonderful in so many ways. And I was miserable. And when it collapsed, I was obsessed. I was manic in my mind. What to do, what to do, what to do, how to cling, how to change, how to call it. I was just manic trying to to control it. And I got a message that cut through and said, don't try to determine what to do next. Watch what is presented to you. Well, as it turns out, my grandparents had to leave a house because they were overwhelmed and couldn't take care of it or themselves there. And all of a sudden there was this big house full of 50 years of stuff it was not my desire to go take care of that problem. And yet I wasn't able to articulate a life in which I didn't just get another job and work 10 hours a day in New York city. So the world presented me with a path that was not pleasant at first and quickly became, Oh my God, of course I needed to be free. I needed my time. I needed space to clear the table and learn to listen. And that was far more important than anything I would have created within my own control. And not only did I have to embrace it, but I had to appreciate it. It's, it's not just about doing it. It's, it's about not resenting. You have to grieve your past. You have to let it go. You can't exist in turmoil and resentment that, this was taken away from you and nothing ever fucking works. You could feel those things, but you have to move through those feelings and get over it. By all means, feel those feelings, but don't fuel them. Don't retain them. Don't keep investing in them. And if you do, immediately try to get some perspective and say, I know that this is not a healthy pattern. What am, what am I missing? Why am I stuck in this? And then you put your work, you put your effort into appreciation. It doesn't mean gloss over everything and make it all positive. I've done some videos on law of attraction and how to be present in positivity in a way that isn't fake. It doesn't mean fake it all the time. 
but it does mean work to put your attention into what's around you. After years, 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 15 years of these, I found myself in San Francisco. I'd slept in a woman's car for three nights. I couldn't stay there anymore. And yet the place I was going wasn't available to me yet. So I had 60 bucks and a backpack. And I walked into Golden Gate Park and I sat down and I spread all my things out. And I looked through them and I took care of them. I took stock of what I had because when, when you have very little and you're on the edge, you pay attention to what you do have. I thought about what was, it was heavy. My backpack was heavy. I was not being entirely smart with everything I had. So I made some choices of things to leave and I left them in a careful pot. They were valuable. I didn't keep anything that was wasteful, but I still left them to just light my load a little. And I kept my guitar and I sat there and I played music. And for the next three days, I played a lot of music and I did a lot of yoga. And I loved it. I deeply appreciated what was right there. I went to an Indian restaurant that had brunches. I had 60 bucks. I went there three days in a row. I had Indian, Indian restaurant that had brunches that were pretty substantial. So it was the only meal I needed in the day. And they had a beautiful bathroom. And so I, I was so grateful that they held space for me and that they weren't, you know, they, they weren't, didn't look at me askance. They weren't averse to my presence because it, the Indian culture in many, many ways has much more respect for people who live on the edge. They could feel it. They gave me respect. I was grungy. <laughs> I was scared. And I would go into that restaurant and drink tea. <sighs> Woo. You ain't never tasted tea so good. Appreciate what you're giving. Don't reach for things that aren't working. Reach for things that might work, but watch for the signs that confirm that that's true. If things you're attempting to do make you petulant and nasty, question them. Immediately look around you and ask, are you taking anything for granted? that you are given, that has been done for you recently, appreciate it. Because life is not torturing you. Life is not a cat waiting to kill you, enjoying the pain you're going through like a little mouse. That's never what's happening. You are being taught to be present. You can't choose to go onto the edge when it's not time. I have not been held in poverty indefinitely. I have sometimes been brought through phases of my life when I had very little. And I learned to experience them as an extraordinary liberation because I was light enough to receive guidance and messages and insight that I would not have been able to hear or embrace otherwise. Appreciate what you've been given already. Tune in from the vibration of appreciation to what steps would be healthiest for you to take now. When you get yourself in that kind of regular psychology, you rewrite your brain to work like that. It took me years, but eventually I learned to hear. It's a real distinct transition was for me. There, there's the three basic phases. I've broken them down more extensively elsewhere, but three basic, you, you can't hear, you start to hear in dreams and visions, and then you can be conversational. The dreams and visions phase is, is years for me. And the beauty of it is exquisite. You have to cherish it, like nurse it, like, a, like you're holding an orange 
appreciating it for for days or weeks making sure making sure it doesn't get damaged you have to cherish the guidance you've been given and don't share it a lot share it at just the right moments respect your own ability to recognize who's going to who's going to help you believe and who's not you can't need support prematurely you do need support you do need respect from others it grounds you it weaves you in in a way that matters but if you haven't gotten it yet be prepared to stay within yourself and learn to recognize maybe you missed something maybe someone else's noise in your head even if it seems positive would get in the way find that balance and you'll learn to unlock the key you have to line these things up you can work on them at different times if you start to pay attention more and more it'll tell you when to pay attention to each to which one you'll be guided increasingly on a path that feels a little bit more like rails it's weird it's like you have more freedom to explore and be aware and to shape reality through your intention but there's increasingly more of a right or wrong thing to do like you could make choices that are just off and it's like poof, won't work well until you get yourself back on a track that is in harmony Recognize it, realize, see between the beside and each between. Reality is just Good. your current events to paint your enemies. Long the sacred, no, you're not alone. Spirit speaks this body is, no, you're not alone. Spirit speaks this body is, oh my god is. Spirit speaks this body is, oh my god is. Spirit speaks this body is, oh my god is. Spirit speaks, this body is my home.